Matasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namatasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namatasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Sadhu 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 so welcome everybody. Um, we're going to look today at, at bhavana is what we're going to look at. And before we do, we're going to go to the beginning, um, so to speak. And we look at the sutta that Bhante likes to use the most in the very beginning of a retreat. And <clears throat> it touches one very important point in the front. So you just listen to the beginning of the sutta here. This is the Dvaita Vitaka Sutta, two kinds of thought, Majjhima Nikaya number 19. Thus I have heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anathapindika's Park, there he addressed the monks thus, Monks, venerable sir, they replied. The Blessed One said this, Monks, before my enlightenment, while I was still an unenlightened bodhisattva, it occurred to me, suppose, that I divide my thoughts into two classes. And then I set on one side thoughts of sensual desire, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of cruelty. And I set on the other side thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of ill will, non-ill will, and thoughts of non-cruelty. So we know non-ill will is loving kindness, non-cruelty is compassion. As I abided thus, diligent, ardent, and resolute, uh, a thought of sensual desire arose in me. I understood thus. This thought of sensual desire has arisen in me. This leads to my own affliction, to others' affliction, and to the affliction of both. It obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties, leads away from Nibbana. And when I consider this leads to my own affliction, it subsided in me. When I considered that it leads to others' affliction, it subsided in me. When I considered it, this leads to the affliction of both, it subsided in me. And when I considered this obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties, and leads away from Nibbana. It subsided in me. Whenever a thought of sensual desire arose in me, I abandoned it, removed it, and did away with it. Now, he goes on and talks about this. And one of the things you see in it right away is an echo from 128. And in 128, section 30, near the end of that, Sutta, where he does the summary about the hindrances he was talking about to the monks. There, he says, as soon as I identified this I, as an imperfection, I abandoned it. So this is the same thing. He's talking about this here. Now, what he's afraid of, he's talking about the thinking, how thinking and thinking and thinking, it tires the mind. Excessive thinking and pondering. If I continue with that, I might tire my body. And when the body is tired, the mind becomes strained. And when the mind is strained, it is far from productive concentration. And so I steadied my mind internally. I quieted it. I brought it to singleness of purpose, which is his meditation. And he concentrated it to the proper level. Why is that? So that my mind should not be, be strained any longer. That's why he did it. 
This was in section eight, when he gets into telling why and how this is working. So this part is really talking to you about understanding. Bhavana, today this, this whole talk is going to be about Bhavana. And the Bhavana, the word is development of mind is how it's always been translated. And a couple, a few years ago, I guess it is now, um, you know, Dr. Pramasiri, we had been talking about it quite a bit. He had students studying with us, and I'm not going to claim that we were the ones that had to do with it. But all of a sudden, he was on an American tour, and he said something very significant when he was traveling through the U.S. He said that development of mind is one translation, but the development of behavior is another that was very significant when he did this. So you can look at it in the position it is in the sutta and what it's talking about and decide what it means whenever you come to bhavana because the reality of what you're doing when you are developing your mind through meditation, the, the bottom line is you are attempting to understand how suffering works, the cause of it, and the cessation of it, and what it causes in your life, right? And once you figure that out, you're gonna change your approach to things. And it's going to happen naturally, that's what's interesting, and sometimes you don't suspect it, that it is happening. Um, one of the students that shocked me when I was teaching, he called me from New York, and suddenly something happened when he was practicing that was significant. And he said, I don't know what happened here, but these guys that when I take a walk with my wife, we always get harassed by these people. And then they, they came when they were taking a walk one evening and they were harassing them. And he turned to them and immediately started sending loving kindness to them. He doesn't know why, and he doesn't know why he didn't get upset. But something happened and it didn't take long for it to click in my mind. I said to him, you just flipped your car out of stick shift into automatic. <laughs> this is what just happened. All of a sudden he was in a vehicle that was automatic, see? And so his mind took over and when the same thing that happens usually come, coming at him, and harassing him, his mind just flipped. Because why? Well, because his mind had been given enough knowledge and enough repetition that it was training itself. And this is what was happening, okay? So let's just go to the paper. Bonte needs to pull this, um, this one up. And there's two, of, there's two of these before it pulls it up. There's two of these, the Bhavana part one, we're going to re we're going to change the name to what is bhavana because <laughs> this one is really all about what is happening what is the bhavana the practice of bhavana mean in the buddhist uh, teaching and then we're going to take the second part and give it its own name we're going to dive into next time a very important one because there's so many examples that we have of this now we need to talk about it and that one is what were the Four Noble Truths and what were they for? What were they actually for in the time of the Buddha? And actually what they were for was for bhavana. And that's, we're gonna get into that in the next one. So let's look at this one first. I need Bhante to um, pull up, I don't know where he went. <laughs> I need you to pull up the document and let me go through that and work from there now okay oh i need to go get it and i need to put it up is that it <laughs> i do this every time all right let me see if i can do it um we uh first go oh it's such an adventure i don't know about this let's see <laughs> oh dear let's see Dr. Perel, don't have too much fun with this, okay? <laughs> Let me see if I can get out of here and find it and come back. Um, just getting out 
and going here. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Whoops, we have a lot of them now. One, two, three, four. Oops, we need one. Okay. Okay, one. Let's see. Find it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so now that it's up, I go back to you, I think. Um, now I come back to you, and then I go... Green button. I go split screen, right? and it's, it's there. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, um, so um, we just explained to you, if you weren't here for a second ago, that bhavana means two things, and that's how we're going to look at it. Uh, the bhav word bhavana means development of mind, but it also means development of behavior. So our behavior, what happens to it is it changes naturally as you continue to apply the in instructions of TWIM and continue, you're actually continuing to keep practicing right effort, what's happening is you're retraining, you're retraining the brain. And the only way the brain can change a habit for a human being is when you do a repetitious repeating of something and you continue repeating and repeating and the brain starts picking it up. And this is what Phil, this is what he figured out what happened. And he had other incidents and he just sort of relaxed into this, became part of his life. This different kind of response instead of an angry reaction. So that was a behavioral pattern change. The bhavana consists of many practices in, in Buddhism. But each one of the practices, no matter what they are, um, whether you're looking at the casino or you're uh, practicing, you're doing it, almost any of them, you are doing it for the purpose of sharpening your ability, uh, your mind. All of it's about sharpening the mind and observation ability. So it consists of many of them that hopefully lead to the highest Buddhist wisdom and generosity and virtue are necessary preparation steps that prepare the mind and the body to succeed in this meditation. Because as what's happening, apparently what's happening is when we start to relax, uh, tranquilize the body and the mind, it's easier for things to pop up and review that were tucked away inside us and the things that are caught inside us are past hurts, past disappointments, um, past things we've done or have been done to us and we lock them up. Now this is part of the job of the brain. Um, if you are a psychiatrist or psychologist, you, you know that this is part of the operation of the brain. And this is the reason for PTSD, for instance. The soldiers suffer from PTSD because the violent incident was so violent it goes it gets lost in a way and they think they're okay coming home but it has the brain has uh taken the trauma and locked it inside so we have to be careful what kind of meditation this is very important i have found over the years in i've only worked with three or four ptsd guys but what i found that was their trouble with other kinds of meditation was that if they're practicing a one point of concentration, sometimes it'll just jump out and they don't know how to handle it. And the people that teach it don't know what to do. And it can be actually pretty dangerous. But when you're practicing the way we're practicing with loving kindness 
and compassion and the joy and equanimity. It's very gentle. And because of that, I think that Vanti can do better with uh, helping people. And that's what I found that you just have to be able to speak and you know what's going on. You have to be able to explain as you go along and give them exercises to um, get back into reality quickly, get back into where they are in the conventional reality. <laughs> anyway, the main objective of your uh, bhavan is to perfect your observation skills to realize full meaning of the Four Noble Truths, the, how human cognition occurs, and the three characteristics of existence. Now, the Four Noble Truths become, we're going to talk very heavily about them next time, so I'm not going to go into them a lot this time. Human cognition, cognition is cognizing, and cognizing, when you're cognizing, you're understanding, you're watching something you're very careful to understand. So cognizing is understanding or comprehending, okay? Okay, and it, the three characteristics are, of course, the impermanence, the suffering, and the way out, which is the anatta. Okay. And these are characteristics of existence on the earth, you see. It's not a private affair for human beings to get involved in this. This is something that is natural with every, a part of nature. For the lay person's perspective, uh, why practice TWIM? We, a lot of us stop and say, why am I doing this? The majority of people are going over here and they're doing this, but why am I doing this? Well, the day-to-day -day benefits of developing this practice are really special. Sharpened observation skills, improved memory, faster calming time, uh, you know, growing light smiles, appreciating yourself and others, the, the comfortable application of logic in life. You, you give yourself space to do that when you're deciding to do things. And it helps us sleep better and wake up in the morning very sharp and ready to go. And it helps develop compassionate responses instead of inconsiderate reactions in life. It just starts happening. And we, we begin to learn to lovingly accept the present time as it is and have more patience and compassion in it while we're involved as we go along. It reveals the internal operation of our personal actions and it changes our perspective and our worldview. It becomes less personal so that we can see from an ultimate reality position that's uh, different from the conventional reality people are caught in. Um, it puts us, uh, it, you know, the, if we were studying in Christianity, we would say it's the God seat. We used to call it that because if you look down God sits up here in theory and looks down and watches everybody. He must know what's going on. And I see this as the same thing as saying, ah, the God seat, but this is not involving a God. This is just telling you how you can actually view things differently by not getting lost in thinking and uh, analyzing and uh, uh, yeah, mental proliferation. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. <laughs> So it helps us balance the past, the future, and the present events. If you're teaching, if you're here and you're teaching or helping people, it's real important if you just start with a person that you give them a basic uh, lesson that's like in the Bhattakarata Sutta. And uh, that's 132, 33, and 34. But the, the phrases, the little prose that's in there is important about the past, the future, and the present events. It's important to stop with the person and really just ask them what is real, what is true about the past, what is true about the future, and what is true about the present. Because there's an interesting thing about the word alive. Alive is a word, if you look it up in the, some of the dictionaries, you'll find out that it has relationship to the life continuum line you're alive. And you say, well, when am I actually alive? If you're not caught in your mind in the past and you're not filled with worry about the future, you're right here in the present time. That's, that's what it means to be alive. 
Now, athletics will tell you this is in the flow. So if you're rollerblading for 70 or 80 miles or riding a bike 150 miles or you're running or skiing or anything like that, when you have perfect performance, they'll say to you, I was in the flow while they were doing that. They were right there with full attention operating, nothing else from the past or future involved. That's what in the flow means. That was the book by Shishi Sinitsyn, who was a Russian athletics coach. Uh, in general, it presents us with an alternative method to bring about peace, harmony, and happiness into our affairs of life with ourselves, our family, our community. And another addition is that it, it just makes us smarter. The reason it makes us smart, I don't know if it physically changes any uh, physical part of you, although I've, I know it does change the brain somewhat. But what I'm talking about is if you know how to recognize, release and relax, the moment you release and relax and let go of craving, there's this space. And this space gives you the opportunity. It's sometimes very small, but as you practice, it gets larger and larger. That you can consider really where you are and what's happening and what is important and what's not important and then make a decision. We've all felt that experience. That's what it's talking about, yeah. So the Buddhist version of dependent origination um, is Paticca Samuppada, which I probably spelt wrong again. I think it's two Ms, okay. Um, it lays out for us step by step, link by link, how a human being experiences life. Once you learn the links, and you don't have to actually remember all these links, we, we try to challenge you to remember seven of these links that come uh, from contact onto the last one, aging and death, okay? But we're talking about a phenomenological experience. Phenomena means one phenomena arising at a time. Logically look at one event at a time and learn to look at the pieces at one at a time of the event. This is what he was playing with back then and he figured out. So once you learn them, they give you an advantage because they show you how to go into editing room uh, an imaginary editing room of your own movie that you call my life. And to see the individual frames of the film, if you can imagine that your life as it's happening is the many scenes that are in a movie. And this gives you the, the uh, advantage of seeing the frames of the film as they're happening. So you can see where you fall into craving, clinging, and suffering. And you can learn how the habitual tendencies work, see where they're happening and how they are the same every single time. And you can learn where the weakest link is so that you can let go of it more easily when you train. So we begin to notice the underlying causal relationships occurring within the structure of this impersonal process and we're witnessing this knowledge firsthand and we see how it affects your perspective and perception of your experience in this existence and that's what changes us because once just as it says when when I saw it was an imperfection, I abandoned it. And when you teach the brain to do that, it begins to understand the components of um, what is an imperfection and what is healthy and, and restful and better to stay with with a clearer mind. At one time or another through life, people decide to pursue clearer understanding by way of a spiritual path. But this is expected and, you know, some do it a lot, some a little, everybody wants answers about the prime questions running around about where did we come from, why are we here, what's really going on, and how does all this work, where are we going. They, this is what the composition of uh, most religions are involved in. Although your final ultimate objective may be uh, reaching the highest level of development in, in the Buddhist teaching called, which we call the super mundane experience of Nibbana, the final one, 
it is your journey along the path that is the new and uh, so new to you and it's eye opening and it keeps your curiosity up. It changes your, your view of the world around you and it opens your heart to, uh, to start to grow that knowledge and wisdom uh, when you're practicing TWIM, for sure it does. And TWIM is special and the most special part about it is you can put it in your pocket, take it with you. You don't have to be at the temple or at the shrine to do it. You take it with you and you're using it all the time in life because you're retraining your life for living through uh, the, the timeline. The Buddha told us very clearly, I teach a Dhamma with a basis, with knowledge, with, with a basis, with knowledge, and with an antidote. He talked about this in the Book of Threes in the Anguttara If you go to verse, I think it's 125. And also, if you go back to 107.2 in Majjhima Nikaya, you're going to find this Dhamma is a gradual teaching, gradual practice, gradual progress. So you're not racing anybody. And there's no trophy. And you don't have to be macho or the big person who gets there first. It doesn't make any difference. That's not what's important. He taught us that you must experience direct knowledge and in order to attain the wisdom you're really reaching for or you read most about. Without generosity and virtue developed and activated in your life where it's going on all the time, your meditation will not be consistent in training. You'll get frustrated because of this and successful and you will not attain the level of wisdom that brings about permanent changes in your life. You'll get frustrated about that if you're not doing it continuously. Uh, and when we say it's vital that we understand we have to keep the precepts all the time in life and the purification going on that they provide so it doesn't fade out. Because the, the brain, they want to know how this works. Somebody said, well, what do you mean? Why? What is this about? I said to you, how old are you? <laughs> how old are you? And I came at 50 years old. And then Bonte says to me, what are you in a hurry for? It's 50 years old. It's not going to happen tomorrow. For 50 years, you've been watching people around you, making mistakes, getting emotionally upset, hugely, grossly emotionally upset, making wrong decisions in your family, and, and that everybody's been a mess. So why is it you think that you can come to the temple and learn something and in a couple, uh, very quickly, you can uh, you know, get the solution and permanently change? And so I backed off, really <laughs> backed off and just sort of, you know, sat into the ride and started doing, following instructions much better. And so along this development path, your bhavana practices consist of things like uh, sitting, standing and walking meditation with reflection. It, and, it's an, and the interwoven meditation into daily life that keeps it going and listening to the Buddha's advice through the Dhamma talks. And there will be exercises, practice drills, and original monks, the ones that the original monks used, that, that's fun to try and dig those out. It would be a great project for somebody to just go through the whole, the whole Majjhima Nikaya. And as you go through, mark the pages that give examples of uh, indications that there was a drill he was actually saying to the monks, when he's teaching them about something. Now tomorrow when you go in the woods and you go to sit down, I expect you to remember to, with your eye for a while in the morning, uh, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. And uh, I, I expect you to practice with the forms and the consciousness and the contact and the feeling and the craving. And, and this is the kind of mantra training that we do in relationship to the way that he was teaching in his meditation school. That's the way I see it. So uh, there is a simple line of questions for ongoing coaching. If you learn these during an online or in-person retreat, then you can actually communicate with anybody who's been trained to be a guiding uh, person, a person that's a guide for you. Any of the teachers will appreciate it. <laughs> 
uh, and they go like this. What per you see, we say what the first question should be, what precisely is your object of meditation at this time? The reason we say that is because as you advance down the levels, the uh, way we describe the, the, the object of meditation becomes different as it develops. It has shadings and it changes as it goes along naturally. How second one is how long is the sitting that you're doing? And basically what's your longest sitting in a day if you're keeping it in a log, uh, just a note, a little asterisk, this is the longest one. Because we don't care about any of the others. We just want to hear about what the longest one was. And then how long did you stay with the object of meditation uh, before the attention was pulled away, before your attention left whatever the object is, how long were you able to stay with it? We want to know that. No seconds, please. Only minutes. <laughs> That's one of the things we used to say to people. Then in, in your own words, you tell the guide the steps of what you did when you were pulled away. And you don't, one of the things that's not acceptable is to say to a guy, oh, I six art. Well, I got news. That could mean about five or seven different things if you don't tell us exactly what your particular six R was, <laughs> okay? So you always tell the guide your step-by-step -step what you did. And our job is to catch you when you're describing, is to catch the part you don't even know you're saying. We can listen and in between the lines, we can tell if you decided to release, 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 or relax, 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 relax. We can hear you say, you know, the person comes and sits down and says basically, you know, I tried this so hard and it's just not working. Well, what did you do? I released and released and released and released. <laughs> say that, you know? Or he says, I released and I smiled once and came back. No, that's not it either. You know? We're very simple instructions, but frustratingly, it is very hard to follow it right away, but it's okay because what's happening is your mind is kicking up what it's used to doing or as close to it as possible as you're trying to train and you have to give yourself a chance and just keep instructing it like it's a little child and just teach it to do this new tendency instead. Then we say anything new come up in the session and you tell us and um, hopefully in less than five paragraphs, <laughs> like in a sentence or two, but what's particularly odd that happened or different, that's what we're after. And if you do walk after you're sitting, you make a little note in there in the same, in the same way. What were you doing while you were walking were you carrying it and, and using the meditation? You see, that's when you, you start doing this with a coach, they can really help you. And I experimented with this and ran a, an experiment when I had time one time. I had four students I took for three months and we did every three days what we do in an interview every day in a retreat. So they were getting continued coaching for that period of time and I would catch them slipping and our job is just to keep you on this track to keep you on the track and keep you going without falling off but when you fall off it's no big deal this is the thing that Bhante's always telling people don't be angry at yourself it's not time to get something and start beating yourself on the back because you fell off the track. Just get up, get back on the track, keep going. You understand what you're trying to do with your brain. Now, some of the drills will help you to internalize the teaching of anatta and forgiveness and loving kindness and compassion. And you'll learn them faster in the brain than you normally would if you do the little drills that we talked to you about. All of these help you grow a smile. It starts happening more and more in a natural way and it okay. lightens, up, lightens up things. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? You can hear me? 
Yes, okay. Good, okay. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Mataji, okay. we can hear you. Okay, yes. good. Thank, thank you. I'm, the hardest thing of teaching on Zoom is I can't see you all. <laughs> That's the hardest thing because both Bonte and I always wondered why doesn't he spend a long time writing a sermon? He doesn't do that. And he taught me the same thing. We have to watch you in a retreat to find out what you need and listen to your interviews in or, and your questions to learn what we have to give you for a talk. So we can't pre-write sermons. It's not that useful. We're teaching you in a much closer in manner. That's why that's important. The other part of TWIM is the terminology. And we're gonna be running into this in this course. We are gonna be running into it different types of ways of using words and seeing things. And the way they got changed, I want you to understand that the only way, time we change the words that Bhikkhu Bodhi has chosen is when we find out they don't understand these words, when we teach with them. And so we have to back up and experiment by using thesauruses to find the same words that mean the same thing that are easier. So when I sit in front of a group of people and I would say to you, applied and sustained thought, you would wonder what I'm talking about. Most of the time with new students. But if I'm sitting in front of you and I say thinking and examining thoughts, let's see, applied and sustained, thinking and examining, thinking and examining works. And you can see it in the face of the person. Right away, they're sitting there going, yeah, I understand that. I'm, a thought comes up and I don't get involved with it. Or examining is analyzing. So this is the place, the kind of changes that are made. TWIM uses terminology that might, not, might sound a little bit different uh, than you're used to hearing. The word wisdom is a really good example. And it's not quite what you would expect it would mean. It's in, it's a broad general meaning that doesn't come close to what all pervading wisdom is in Buddhism. Buddhist wisdom can't be found in any English dictionary. Uh, the Pali word for wisdom I'm talking about is panya, okay? And it's almost as, as slippery as the word, um, what's that one? Not samadhi, but... I'll think of it later. There's, a one, there's one word that is an S word. I, somebody can say it I, if you think of it, um, where you, it has 100 different meanings. And depending on where it shows up, that tells you what it meant. There are words, Sankara. Sankara. That's it. That's it, Sankara. And it's a real bugger because you, you know, can be writing in, um, you know, Nanyananda, the way he uses um Sankara, San, 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 yeah, I can't remember what it was, but he, he explains how that word goes all over the place. And, um, and that word is, is similar, Panya is a little bit different because Panya, listen to what happens. In, in the Dhamma, dependent origination is considered to be the spine of the teaching and wisdom appears to be a code word in an underlying, with an underlying meaning that's in the text. You see, and, and it's um, a pointer word. That's why I say it's like a code word. When you find it used within a sutta or at the end of a sutta, uh, try, if you just try looking at, um, looking for an implied relationship to the seven practice links of dependent origination, the, you can refer to, from the contact link to the aging link is the seven links I'm talking about. And, and this line of human cognition clarifies a considerable difference uh, between what a feeling and an emotion are and their relationship to how suffering occurs in us. And the wisdom that uh, when you say, for instance, at the end of a sutta, and it could be, I can't go directly, but there's a lot of them in the book when you can flip to the last pages of suttas and you're always going to find one of these. And his taints were destroyed by his seeing with wisdom. And that 
is what set off the search for this, that phrase. And then you have, he is wise, and he has uh, this sharp wisdom, wide wisdom, uh, all these different descriptions of wisdom used in Anupad, Anupada Sutta are not just poetry. They have to do with how you're able to watch dependent origination. Do you see it deeply or widely? Do you see it around you all the time? Do you see it immediately when something happens or broadly across a spectrum? And when you start looking at this, it's fascinating. The Kabodi calls the um, dependent origination, and it's also called dependent co-arising by some of the universities like to say co-arising, okay? And the, uh, when he talks about it, he says, this is the spine of the teaching. What does it mean to be the spine of a teaching? Well, if I, if I pick up a dead animal, or a, an animal that just died by, by his neck and see the spine, there's a whole structure. But without the spine, there's just a sack full of pieces inside. There's nothing there. And this is true with the human body too. Pull the spine out and see what you have. <laughs> it's interesting. And all your nervous systems running off the spine, you know, this is it's fascinating. So you play with it. And as we go through the course, I'll also mention to you, whenever we find, we're talking about something, we run into it, what does that mean with wisdom? This word here, what is it meaning now? So this is how we talk about Buddhist wisdom, various occupations, look at it this way. This is why are we searching for this? Various occupations in life lead people to pursue various kinds of expertise and wisdom. There are nautical engineers, uh, develop nautil, nautical wisdom. There are doctors with medical wisdom, operative wisdom, psychological wisdom. Uh, scientists develop scientific wi wisdom. And there is physics and sports and arts and dance. It's endless, specific things. So the question is, you can't just say, we want to get wisdom. So what exactly was Buddhist wisdom? That's why we started looking around at this and digging every time we had spare time for a long time. It means cognizing the truth of how suffering in life in this, works in the same way for all of humanity, all of humanity across the globe. And as we pursue our development, our minds are opening for a deeper understanding of how everything operates. Occasionally, I will try to point out these words. The Buddha changed the, also another thing he did that was significant in his time and caused a lot of debates. <laughs> okay. The Buddha changed the student teacher relationship for learning Dhamma. He knew that the best retention of this knowledge would occur in a human being when they learned something by hearing it, writing it down or reflecting on it in memory and testing for themselves how something works. So you, you have to see it. With the dis this discovery, he departed from the usual form of teaching in his day and where students were being told something while they are listening to it without questions. He stepped away from the old teacher-student relationship and he promoted learning by listening memorizing, examining the meaning, reflecting on it, seeing it and practicing it with striving. Look at MN 95, 30, section 34, and you're gonna find the list of what you need to do to be successful at anything you try in life. You can become an expert at anything you wanna do if you just follow those points. A friend of mine who was a Christian in Missouri, he was the head of the engineering department at Southern Missouri University. And um, it was his turn to do the orientation for the freshmen coming into the college. He took 95 and he taught it as the way the students should come into the university with their expectation and behavior and what they should do to become the best engineers on earth. 
He demanded, the Buddha demanded that his monks learn through knowledge and vision first, the yata, bhutana, nandasana, and meet together and ask questions such as in the questions and answers that you find in uh, with Sariputta and with Dhammadina. And this is in Majjhima Nikaya number 43 and 44, those two suttas. Now, knowledge and vis wisdom, knowledge and vision, sorry, strongly carried the Bodhisattva forward on his journey and completely in his away, completed his awakening. He points out that he developed his wisdom by seeing and revealing a hidden path with hidden insights, unrevealed, unseen before, that was uncovered for himself without a teacher. Now, this part actually becomes the definition for the Buddha within the Theravada, the elder school, which is part of where we come from, okay? Being a Buddha is far above becoming an Arahat. It is not the same thing, and the two uh, have separate definitions. The wisdom he uncovered is framed for us by the Four Noble Truths the impersonal process of dependent origination and the three characteristics of existence, the anicca, dukkha, anatta. That's the picture of it. And you have to add into that an in-depth examination, comprehension, and use of the 37 requisites of awakening. We're going to go there too later in another class. So pursuing bhavana as the development of mind, it refers to how everything connects together and it leads to the actual cessation of suffering. You make no mistake about this, the Buddha Dhamma isn't hypothetical, poetical, theological dogma, or philosophical propositions. It is definitively a scientific pursuit to prove for yourself a cognitive, psychological discovery that will change your life. It has a clear basis, a clear set of knowledge, and a clear antidote for suffering was found, and this becomes the basis of his teaching. The practice, however, is not an immediate fix, like I was explaining to you, depending on how old you are, what kind of habits you have before, what kind of things you practice before, if you bring this chef's training into this chef's kitchen, it won't work, okay? It doesn't work. It's like taking the person who absolutely was trained by this French chef and taking them into this American kitchen. It's just not always gonna work, okay? The practice is an, not an immediate fix. We need to remember how old we are, and I already talked to you about that. Only patience leads to Nibbana. Change only comes with the patience. And therefore, over 45 years of teaching, the Buddha created a gradual teaching, gradual practice, gradual progress, through which one could gauge it and follow their progress. And you need, somebody needs to remember to ask the question, how do we gauge and follow our progress? Just remember that one. To ask it at the end, I'll show you. Your rate of success is directly proportional to how well you can follow the instructions and keep the practice going all the time. In the early stages, the practicing twim, your brain is asked to follow some new intentions. It's being given instructions it's never had before and you are essentially retraining your brain. So retraining the brain is the proper term here. Your brain is learning a new habit through the repetition of your practice cycle. We know that the Buddha's original investigation practice is still described universally as easy to understand, immediately effective here and now, inviting inspection, so we should come and see it. And that is uh, that it would be unaffected across time till today. That means it will still work the same way today. If we have the instructions and we understand them correctly and we apply them correctly, he's saying it will work no matter what time frame you're in. 
I'm curious, can you see Twim fulfilling this description of the original practice? This practice cycle only has the application of six tiny steps in one fluid motion to learn. Whenever a distraction comes up and it's pulling away your attention, you are to recognize this unwholesome situation or distraction or tension that's happening. Release your attention off the distraction. Relax the tension left over in your head or mind. Gently re-smile as you return to your object of meditation and then continue your observation investigation and repeat the cycle only as it's needed, only when you are distracted. You have to put this, brand it on the front of your head. I'm only going to do the six R's when <laughs> this is a distraction. I'm not going to try to suffocate my brain and make it stop thinking. <laughs> You're not going to do that. And you're not going to come in to interview with me and say, I found the answer. The answer is, I'm not going to feel anything anymore and then I won't suffer. That's not the answer, okay? That's not the right answer, the solution. Within these short, quick steps is a recipe for purification and a recipe for retraining your brain. The first two steps are cleansing mind, purifying them of any unwholesome mind states. You see these first two here, okay? And then the next three steps are retraining the brain, encouraging it to return to wholesome practices. And the last step is supporting mind to continue in a wholesome direction and repeat the training again as needed. Mm -hmm. So you keep smiling all the time so that your brain will imprint these six R's and eventually begin to six R automatically. The way I was talking to you at the very beginning of this discussion, I was talking to everybody about how it will automatically change to automatic without you asking it to, and it will become the way that it deals with things. So you will begin to pause and um, you will begin to pause and decide what to do instead of just knee jerk reactions all the time. <clears throat> how does the brain learn? We've already kind of been talking about this. It learns from habits of repetition. The more often that you do the six R's as needed, the faster the brain will pick up the message that this is what you want it to do, to, to how you want it to run this cycle when anything begins to indicate an arising suffering. Now, the rising tension is your cue. That's your cue. Feeling, as far as the Vipassana side of this is like, if you've been in Vipassana, you've been in touch with your feelings. So from the Vipassana side of this, I'm not gonna cut it out, <laughs> but if you feel, get, if you're sensitive to the arising of tension and tightness that's coming towards the pop of anger, you are, need to refine your observation. The moment you notice this tightness is happening, then you need to run your six R's because that's the pulling part that's already gonna try to pull you away. It's a new idea for the mind. And in most cases, the brain is used to grabbing onto craving and suffering. This is new. So you've got to be patient and persistent until the mind finally gets it and takes over. Just the way you were persistent with your children to behave at the table <laughs> and do as they're told by their parents, you need to do this with your brain. We know that there are different practices going on. Before the Buddha was enlightened, it's described in the text in various places. And we, um, we, didn't, it, we know that it didn't work well because, for him because there was too much of the wrong kind of effort put into it. That was one of the biggest issues was the, um, 
it was the uh, the struggle against the distractions and the attempt to overwhelm them and destroy them. That was the big thing. And anything that's causing stress in the mind is not allowing this mind to open up and to bloom. That's the important part. You look at your brain, somebody who's an artist out there needs to draw me a picture of a brain that's desperately trying to bloom like a flower. That's what it should be. We know something changed the night the Bodhisattva awakened. And this is the real message for us. It happens in Majima Nikaya number 36 uh, from section 31 and 32, specifically is the cue of what happened. And as Rice, this is interesting, we're talking terminology here. As Rice Davies pointed out in the notes in his dictionary, there were notes for some of the words, instead of using the word ikagata that meant one-pointed concentration, the Buddha may have chosen another technique. I'm sorry, the Buddha may have chosen another word that should say, um, because he created another technique, he chose to give it a different word to designate the lighter, more productive practice that he found. This is what Rice Davies note said. I don't have the dictionary. I couldn't look it up here. We are all aware of it. We all saw it when we were doing the research. We know it's there. And his point is he would not have, uh, there was no reason for him to take and create another word that meant concentration. Ikagata was there. So there was no reason to invent samadhi and say it meant concentration. So looking at that, the way he's talking about it, by our own experience, we suspect that the word he chose was samadhi, which is perhaps wrongly taken to mean concentration today. And this is what causes the, the lack of progress in one kind of practice versus this aware jhana type of practice, okay? And in fact, the word samadhi can be split into two parts when you're researching it. You take sama and plus d, and ex he explains that this means tranquil plus wisdom. Could this have been what the Buddha called his new practice? Nobody will ever know for sure. <laughs> Nobody will ever know. But if you look at samadhi that way, when it's showing up, then I think you're going to have a different understanding of what's happening in the suttas. <clears throat> so this is where twim comes in, because the name uh, was abbreviated from this, tranquil wisdom insight meditation. That's twim. The serenity component in the practice is completed in the tranquil part of the definition sama. And this includes the access to the aware jhanas. The insight component is completed by the indication, <coughs> the indication of discovery of wisdom in the form of the arising insights and that's rooted from the D. The texts indicate that for his success, the two components were yoked together. And this is noted at Majima Nikaya number 149, section 10. And also it's pointed out, I found it in some other suttas, the term yoked evenly together again. So remember, if you weren't here last time, uh, we talked about yoked together doesn't mean something that is on top of something else like this, okay? It means that it's beside it and it's yoked together like two bulls or two horses that are pulling a cart. So these two pieces are not happening in the same moment, but they're in, interwoven and supportive of each other, you see? And when you have an insight, you're going along like this and they're both potentially there and you go, oh, wow, there we go, we're still meditating. And then you say, oh, look at that. 
Woo, but this one is putting you in the right conditions so that this one can happen. That's what is happening here. You need to experiment with it. You need to ask questions about it. We keep going with it. By practicing the twim in the way that we're showing you, there's a unique opportunity to investigate how this practice works. The serenity component calms down the mind and the insight component supports the arising insights and brings the new knowledge that contributes and compounds to eventual wisdom as you begin to wake up in the actuality of life, which is how everything works. Actuality of life is a term from Karuna Dasa's book. Um, I'm going to say the foundation of um, the foundation of Buddhism, I think it is called. Okay. So try to remember to keep your mind clear, alert, and aware as possible, and to follow the instructions closely so that you keep on impersonally observing what is happening next as the deepest levels on the path begin to open up in front of you. And we'll have another class on that point, the path itself and how it works in more depth. Twin practice reconnects with universal laws of nature. We're using the elements in the practice within our training. We learn in, to calm down with clear observation of the ground uh, and be as firm as the ground and the water, the fire, the air, and the space. If you refer to what I'm talking about, you need to read Majima Nikaya number 62, the sections between 13 and 17 will show you how the Buddha was coaching his son Rahula and explaining to him how to use the elements while you're meditating and learn from them. Your post sessions in life start calming down, reactions fading into responses with space now for logical solutions to arise and compassion becomes clear and relationships begin to clear up and improve. And all of this is good signs. And we need to put our faith into the Buddha, into the uh, Buddha's words as we practice twim. Faith is important to have the faith in the teacher and trust what he's saying and test everything. You only accept what you know by seeing firsthand. This is your rule and your instruction. Knowledge and vision of how things actually work begins to offer you direct knowledge. Direct knowledge, these two are synonymous. They're the same thing. You see them mentioned here or there in the text. They mean the same thing. They talk about knowledge and vision of how things work as an actual attainment in the middle of the line of your development. We'll see that in another class too. Most important thing is whether your practice is operating in line with the descriptions in the Pali Canon. You check for yourself as you're hearing Bhante give talks and you're hearing me give talks and we're talking in class. Is what we're saying lining up with the text? You need to be alert and keep asking. Are you understanding and the, te the texts as they come together in sync with the objective of reducing suffering? This is what you keep in mind and keep checking as you're going along with your development. You do have team of helpers. This is kind of cool. We think we don't have anybody helping us and you actually do have a team that is helping you from the beginning of your practice, not just coming as a un unit like the team all together and knocking on the door at some point in the meditation development and saying, well, here we are, we're going to work now for you. It's not quite like that. These, this, these team members are actually with you in your practice and for you from the beginning, so just listen. You are not alone on this journey down the path. I want you to meet your support team who have been with you from the very beginning. They will continue to assist you in your efforts 
And you may not realize it, but your team has been right there with you from the beginning of your meditation. They are growing strength as you develop. At first, you need only to meet and greet them. And this is where, this is where they show up, how they show up. Beginning your TWIM session, human curiosity turns on mindfulness observation to assist your investigation. Your persistence, energy, and repetition keep your practice going. Six R's counteract distractions as mind reaches its proper condition, uplifted joy arises. Joy fades away, so tranquility can arise. Tranquility fades away for collected mind to usher in the deeper states to support arising equanimity. And there you have your team members, 57 words. <laughs> We yeah, worked a while to shrink that one down. <laughs> the team members are mindfulness on the t-shirt, the first one. Investigation is the second one. Energy, then comes joy, and then tranquility, then uh, collected mind, collected uh, mind, and then uh, equanimity. Now you have a few people on the bench, just in case anything happens. These guys sit on the bench and they come when you need them. First one is curiosity. Second one is persistence. Third one is called repetition. Those are the three that sit on the bench. So I was doing a children's book for a Sunday school once and I was using this and we were having a lot of fun with it. <laughs> Your practice supports you to discover how impersonally as you're developing and learning how everything works, your practice supports you to discover how impersonally the optical, auditory, olfactory, oral, and physical systems of the human body operate. For the first time, we actually realize how impersonally we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, and how uninvited thoughts can arise as physical and mental formations. We are witnessing human cognition through our entire investigation. I think this should all go to some kind of conference for uh, psychology and psychiatry. <laughs> That's my feeling about this. You know, we, we begin to wonder what the cause of our suffering is in relationship to craving now because craving is out there in Buddhism. Suffering is caused by craving. We, we hear this up front in most traditions, right at the front door. Although we have been told craving causes suffering, it is not immediately clear how we can let go of something so undefined unless we know precisely what it is and how it works. So we are going to discover that craving always manifests in the same way for every human being. It comes up the same way in everybody. It doesn't matter who you are. The first symptom of arising craving is a change in the tension and tightness inside the mind and the body. It is the I don't like it or the I like it mind. Each time we practice the six R's, we are letting go of the tension of suffering. By mentally letting go of craving and clinging, all the tension is released. Do this enough times and the suffering stops. Incident by incident, this is true too. You immediately realize that. This is a learned tendency that we are training mind to take over and operate automatically. Okay, I don't know, tell, somebody wave to me, Perel. Um, Dr. Perel, will you, okay, Dama Gavesi, you need to wave at me if we lose, if you lose me, so I know, because I have an unstable connection is what it's telling me, the rain started, okay? Okay, along the way, during our observation, we may be interrupted by some uninvited guests. 
And there are five basic hindrances that we are talking about. Lust and greed, hatred and aversion, sloth and torpor, restlessness, guilt and remorse, and doubt. Within the texts, these are, there are additional ones that are related to these five. They're like cousins that are there and you find them in Majim in the Kaiwan number two, number four, number 22, number 128 and 77, I think. You, you see these other ones that are there. The phenomenal, like the phenomenological approach to understanding this, how this is um, working with the development of the suffering in the human cognition is dependent origination is going to be another class, okay? Once we have twin instructions, we have the most effective advantage to help ourselves and others to overcome suffering in all kinds of life situations. The moment that we notice tension arising, it's the, it's the seed for frustration, dislike, fear, anxiousness, anger, jealousy. We just should never mind it and six R. And with the proper knowledge and practice, a wholesome intention and desire to pursue the path more strongly and reach the point of liberation will arise in us as we keep practicing by applying proper courage, determination, energy, skill, and patience to stay on track with your instructions, you will not fall off track very often. The point here is not to beat yourself up. Always stay determined and go back onto the track and continue on. We're going to pursue the way to change our perspective and find new hope for the future or not. It's all totally up to us. It's up to us. This is the end of part one. It gives you a feeling for um, basically, it give, it's trying to give you a feeling for um, the different kinds of bhavana, the different kinds of bhavana that people are practicing and trying and using, all these things come together. It's like this weaving, weaving together of how everything comes together in the training. So I want to ask you guys, are you using your practice in daily life? Are you seeing changes? I know some of you are doing some neat things. We have a hospital now where they have smile stickers right here. I think that's the greatest thing I've ever seen happen in COVID because uh, I can't smile at people and I, I'm a smiler, you know? And I, I was concerned, but I realized, you know, that my eyes are smiling. I, I realized that. But when you get in a hospital, you know, and you have these big shields, then it's like you get sick, you go in a hospital. Can you imagine as a child, some space guy comes over with a big thing on and a big outfit, and you think this is not normal. Mommy, what's happening? <laughs> this is going crazy, you see? And so the invention that was happening here and it got written up in the paper, it's in Bondra, is that right? It was in the Bondra paper, I think. Yeah, or in, uh, was it? In, in the paper in Bondra? Yeah. And they wrote it up about the hospital because the hospital decided to have everybody put smiling face right here. And this is, this is a good thing. I think they should do it at NASA. <laughs> Can you imagine these guys showing up on the moon and they're not smiling and they can't see through the space suit if they are smiling? Same thing. I don't think we're gonna have a good reputation out there if we don't smile. <laughs> so this is the thing in, in the, um, Main thing is repetition. Main thing is actually doing your sitting once a day and getting at least 30 minutes in in sitting. Try to walk. Try to sit and then walk. 
if you can do that. Uh, we had a lot of students who were uh, being taught uh, in the online retreats and they're working. If they're still working, uh, this is before COVID, <laughs> they're working in their jobs. They have to listen to the Dhamma talk then at night, get up and sit in the morning, get up, take your shower, get dressed, then sit. Grab yourself something to eat, get in the car, go to work. When you get to work, you're working the day, you have a break. My advice to hospital personnel is jump in the utility closet for 10 minutes. <laughs> you know, somewhere on the hall, there's always a utility closet. You can jump in, it's quiet. <laughs> for 10 minutes, just 10 minutes, and give yourself a power sit. So what's a power sit? Let's talk about power sits because they're pretty useful. What do I do with power sits? Power sits were given originally, I was giving them to engineers that were doing double types of, uh, double types of um, working periods, what I'm trying to say, uh, periods for working. And they were doubling up on their shifts in this project and they couldn't think they couldn't, and they were doing brainstorming and they needed to think. And I gave them this idea, what happens if you just sit very quietly in a corner, you can face the wall if it's in a relief room where there's a lot of people coming, you can let people know you're gonna do this and just sit in a chair and face the corner. And face the corner. Let go of the importance of anything that is sound or touch or taste or smell or anything, just let it all go out of your mind. And you sit there and simply do your breathing and sending loving kindness to yourself. Just sitting and uh, I even suggest, depending on what's going on, well, in the emergency room when they were doing it, they told me they would sit and do like maybe 10 breaths and then they would send the loving kindness to themselves and they would forgiveness if they needed the forgiveness they felt like they needed it they would use the forgiveness with themselves and this is very powerful you're sending this loving kindness to yourself and you're letting it wash over you like a waterfall and you smile you close your eyes you're out in the country you're sitting under a waterfall. I know there's waterfalls around here, not just flooding. I know there's waterfalls. And you go under a waterfall and just let it wash all over you in your mind and calm down and just let that soothe you and just be there with it. This is what gave me the hint, by the way, the waterfall that maybe what we're trying to do here is examine what would be left of our brain and how we would behave. If we could step away to just sit in a bubble briefly, this is not your major sitting I'm talking about. This is just a power sit. You're just absent of everything outside and just try, just let yourself, it's not try to do it, it's let, allow yourself to experience an experience of no experience. And anything that comes up at all, it's not important for you to know what it is, it's not important for you to know where it came from, it's not important, let it go and fall down with the water. Anything that comes up, be like the water. Flow right around, right around this rock like the water would flow. In your mind, just let it go and just do that. You stick your timer on, you have 10 minutes. When you go to lunch, you look brighter than anybody else in the lunchroom because you were just absent when you come back you just take a deep breath and you say, okay, I'm back. And what is okay about being back if you're working a shift in a hospital with COVID? Well, Anicha, <laughs> the shift comes to an end and the people do change at the shift. Hopefully there's enough people to keep doing that. We don't want 
it to be doubling up on shifts in this situation because of the immune system breaking down to protect us if we wear ourselves out. We have to be very, very careful. So let me take questions here for a little bit. Any questions on what we went over? Mm -hmm. um, Perel, mm -hmm. yeah. can you hear my, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. yeah. I really, uh, I wanted to thank you first. Uh, yes. Really great to look at you and hear you. And uh, so the, my question is that uh, how do I gauge the progress that I have made? Uh, oh, you know, you it, remember that, yeah. Remember, yeah. Okay. The first thing that we see about progress, the first thing we see, there's two pieces that are really important we found in the text about this. One is in the Diga Nikaya, and it's number 2810. It's uh, Diga Nikaya, Sutta number 28, section 10. And what this is, was happening during a discussion between Ananda and the Buddha. And um, Ananda, it's kind of funny. I always, every time I say this, I always see Ananda standing beside the Buddha while, or else he's shaving the Buddha or else he's standing while the Buddha is doing something. And he just casually says, you know, you are such a marvelous teacher. This is in the suttas, like you are such a marvelous teacher. And the Buddha very casually, he turns to him and he says, why am I marvelous? <laughs> that's a wonderful thing, you know. That's what's happening. Why am I, why do you say, uh, tell me why they say I'm marvelous teacher. He wants to know from what's going on with the monks. And he says, one of the first things that he describes, there's a few things there, but the one thing that stood out, you have given us the modes of progress. That's what he says. Ah, and Ananda, what are the modes of progress? He says to him. And then Ananda says, we are four modes of progress. The first one is, if you're sitting in a painful sitting and you have slow comprehension of the Dhamma, that is poor progress. Second one, if you are sitting in a painful meditation and you have clear, quick, clear comprehension of the Dhamma, that is poor progress. The third one is if you're sitting in a pleasant meditation and you have slow comprehension of the Dhamma, that one is also poor progress. You have three poor progresses. The only one that's excellent is if you're sitting in a pleasant meditation with quick, clear comprehension of the Dhamma. So Bhante said to me when I showed him this, he says, and what do you see there when you, when you see this modes of progress? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? And the first thing that came to my mind was he's measuring his monk's progress by two components, not one. You see, he's measuring the monk's progress on the, their development. And you can do this too. We can do it ourselves. That's why they were so, they liked it so much. By whether you are able to sit in a pleasant meditation for long periods of time, so you can have time to observe how everything's working internally, watching this observation tech, you know, the mindfulness development. And the second part of it is, you are also understanding and comprehending this Dhamma, so you are learning how to connect it together. And he said, that's good, go back to the woods. <laughs> so I went back to the woods and started working some more, you know. But the thing about it is, this was important to me because I never thought about it that way. And I never thought that he was ranging this way, but they have to be able to comprehend what we're talking about, the pieces in all of this. 
And next time we do a, next time we do the lesson class on Wednesday, you know, the next one is what we changed it from bhavana to it is part of bhavana, and you hear a lot about bhavana in it. But what it really is, the lesson is about what was the four noble truths and what were they for? What were they for? This is what the comprehension part of the four noble truths is. And it's a lot more than people realize. And they don't realize it usually because they are not exposed to the suttas. And when I go and talk to monks who are bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, PhDs in this stuff, it, they were only exposed to five, maybe six suttas unless they majored in the suttas and went to work with them development themselves. The average one going through the Buddhist studies in the universities are not exposed to the suttas. And I think I told you when I was working with master's degree students, helping them with their papers for some, the universities over in, uh, in Sri Lanka, that one of them, you know, he was uh, doing his paper primarily about hindrances. And he was doing about a lot of what the teaching was, but he had a whole section on hindrances. And uh, I was asking him to come over for one hour each time to go over sections of the English and the grammar and everything. And I wasn't getting involved in it this much to, to comment on the bibliography or what, but when I saw what with bibliography, I went back when I was reading this section, I went to the bibliography and looked and I, I said, oh my gosh, how can this be? I mean, this is a master's thesis and almost the entire thing is based on the Vasudhi Maga in reference and nothing else. And I thought about that for a minute. Then I went back into the offices the next day and I wandered around each of the professors looked in the doorway at the desk. I noticed something. On the desk of every one of those professors was the Vasudhi Maga. But the text, the individual Nikayas, in order for the students I asked around to get to them and work with them, you had to go across the campus to the library to get them. There wasn't a library for them with multiple copies in the Buddhist studies department the way there was at Siba up in Palakeli there was. I mean, there, there was both a Buddhist uh, section in the Buddhist department and then there was library downstairs. But here in this big university, this was not the case. So I didn't stop there. I wanted to ask for a couple years, everybody I ran into about this. And I found out some things, you see. And what's happening is uh, that when you study the Buddhist studies courses, before you can get your degree, you are required to study the suttas. Oh, I thought, well, that's good. But what does it mean? It's basically a uh, one credit course, not a three credit course, a one credit course that you're required to have in order to get your diploma. And what it, in, what it means is you're required to, ex you will be exposed to four and possibly five. There's a possibility of the fifth one. But what it is, is the, um, the Satipatthana Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya, the Maha Satipatthana Sutta, in the Digha Nikaya, and then the, um, the Anapanasati Sutta, okay, you're in, you have to do that one, and then you go back to the Digha Nikaya, that one's in the Majjhima Nikaya, and then you go back over to um, the Digha Nikaya again, and the Parinibbana Sutta is mandatory. And that's a long sutta. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, for one, for one semester of a one credit course, this is a lot, okay? And then what several of the professors told me, I said, if they have, after somebody said something to me, I said, what do they do if they get stuck on understanding something? Are you there teaching the class? He said, oh, no, no, no. He said, this is a one credit course and they're required to go through these four suttas and if they have any questions about what they mean at all, they're required to get the answers from the Vasudhi Maga, which is the voice of somebody else saying what the Buddha did. And it's not even that. I want you to be careful when you, when you say what the Vasudhi Maga actually is. 
it's important you understand. It was a collection of commentaries that this, the job that Buddhaghosa got, he won a contract so that he was able to put together and blend together um, all of the, it's about 120 or something like that, 125 commentaries that were in a library and he was supposed to take them and examine them and there was a lot of uh, disagreement going on at the time between monks about what was really what the Buddha did and what wasn't. And the elders wanted to smooth this over. And so the idea was we'll take all these commentaries and stop this argument once and for all. We will bring somebody in who's an expert who can take this and combine it so it isn't even his voice. You see, saying this to you, it's the, what seems to be the most blended opinion of 120 commentaries in one spot is a reference book. When you examine the book, which finally I did, <laughs> and I've gone through it many times for many reasons now, but finally I said, I can't stand it. I have to go see this. And when you see the book, the one section on the Sheila is fantastically well written and good and wonderful. And we use quite a bit of it. When we explain certain things about Sheila, we, we use a lot of it. Um, but the problem is then you have this large section of the book, which is about concentration. Now the part, let me give you an example of something interesting. We teach you the method called the barrier method to learn the Brahma Vihara practice. But we do not do that with the other practice. We do it with this practice of meditation we're showing you. So we're teaching you how to progress through the barriers and experience all four of the realms in the Brahma Vihara, but we are not doing it with one point of concentration. We're not. So this, Permeation, by the time, you have to understand also, when did this get written? What had happened from the time of the Buddha to this point is important to consider also. This book comes from 1200 years back, about 1200 or 1300 years back. The Buddha comes much further back, 25, 2600 years. Now, when you play with this a little bit and the timing stuff, I, I've written articles and done stuff about it over the years and researched it. Most of the historians that I questioned about this would say to you that um, there were no more Arahats 100 to or 150 years out from the Parinibbana. There's no more Arahats. That's what most of them will tell you. They don't believe there's any more. So when you hear about an arahat today, what does it mean? Well, one of the things that happens with the variation of all the different ideas about what the Buddha taught and not having any central point to be the guidance system because they, they've already taken those and put them in the library. They've, they've divide, they're decide, de depending on this, is it's not working anymore so we have to do a few things. We can make up a story about what an arahat is that's a little bit different from what it was and say there's still arahats. That happens in some places, you know? That's obviously or not obviously. You have to really investigate. And when I say this, I'm being just candid with you because in order to know, uh, you know, is um, Dr. Weera an Arahat? Let me say, how do I figure out if Dr. Weera is an Arahat? I have to be there with him for at least 30 or 40 days to actually see his behavior and ask him questions and see how he answers and all this other stuff. And nobody's willing to do this kind of thing anymore. It doesn't happen. People aren't willing to even serve a monk and leave their job and serve a monk for periods of time. It's one of the issues that happened with Bonte. How did I end up being an attendant for a monk? Well, it's not unheard of for a woman to be an attendant for a monk, but it's just happened because in America, 
there are no men getting in line to be an attendant for a monk. That's not gonna happen with Americans. And it's not gonna happen with most people in Europe and a lot of people here are not gonna do that kind of thing. It was a fluke. That means it was a, what, an enigma or something that, no, what, an anomaly because of my life and what happened and where I was with closing my business and everything that happened in life at that point put me in a position where I could do this and help him travel and help him build the place and just all this stuff that happened. You see, we had strict guidelines with this thing. Oh boy, did we too. You know, with me living on one part of the property and him living on the other and all this stuff about where we drove in everything in the country. But coming back to the text, the problem with the Arahat thing was, um, you also have to watch it when somebody says, I'm an Arahat, who says so? There's that issue also. And someone will say, there can't be Arahats because the only one who can say there's an Arahat is a Buddha saying there's an Arahat. But we stepped back, we had teachers who knew if there was an Arahat, but now we don't have teachers who know that there's an Arahat. So we got a problem here with people walking around, I, I'm an Arahat, you're an Arahat, you know. <laughs> This is crazy, you know, and I, I've been where there, I investigated one very famous one in uh, Sri Lanka who just starts all kinds of problems with the monks in, in Sri Lanka, all kinds of issues and problems where the people just fled to him. I stayed there. I didn't know what would happen. <laughs> I went there with a, a senior monk, 29 year monk, Chinese monk from Kalenia University. Now he's a man and remember that's a big part of this. But as a female, I said, why don't we go and just stay there if he'll let us for two or three weeks and just see. We were curious, both of us. So we did and he lived in one part and I lived in another part of this temple two ends, stayed there. You would not believe how many repercussions there were from me visiting the Arahat and even asking questions and investigating and how terrible this was to even ask or find out. There were things that told me pretty much right away, this is not an Arahat. But what I, one time, also it was really funny, one time, um, you know, uh, one time, I was standing in front of someone and he introduced me uh, to the man and said, she believes I'm an Arahat. And I just stood there and said, no, I don't. <laughs> that was interesting. <laughs> and I said to the man very clearly, there are significant reasons why I can say that he's not an Arahat, but I can't say that he's not an Anagami or something else. I don't really care, but the people loved him because he could speak to them kind of like I'm speaking to you on just an honest earthly basis one-to-one. -one. I can just talk to you, see? And um, he did that in his presentations. The special part was his presentations were 20 minutes long and 15 minutes long, tiny points that farmers and local people could take and use and go away with, and they did. And he had large donations and is building a temple complex, a huge complex in the central geographical point for Sri Lanka in the middle of it, he is. And he wanted me to stay and I'm there, no, I don't belong here, <laughs> I couldn't go. But when I left, uh, that's when I got criticized for even asking. And that was where I put my foot down, I guess as an American said, look, I have the right to ask. I have the right to investigate. And the monk said to me, he's older, you know, and I didn't realize that uh, Tashi was that old, you know, but, but um, he, he was like a 29 year monk, a Mahatera monk. And he said to me, you're an adult. You can go there and ask questions, go find out, why not? And I said, well, it's just not done if there's an active Sangha organization in a country and they've declared it not true that you would ask a question. You see, this is the thing. So the four suttas are Anapanasati, Satipatthana, Mahasatipatthana, 
and Paranibbana Sutta. They're the ones that are investigated, okay? The extra one is 62. Number 62, the Maha Rahula Wada Sutta. The Maha Rahula Wada Sutta has some special stuff in it. Now, I think it was um, Dr. Major said something on the group about the Sutta Nipata and how much it talks about the Brahma Vihara practice and it doesn't emphasize uh, the breathing meditation the way you would expect it to. When you read 62, you begin to see why. Because you have to pay attention when you go to 62, you pay attention from verse, um, I think it's section 18. Section 18 has a funny story. Almost every sutta, section 18 seems to have a, a prime point. It's very interesting. If you look at 62, section 18 to 21, mm -hmm. this is where when you read this whole sutta and you understand what happened in the sutta is that Rahula gets up in the morning and he goes for his alms round and he comes back and eats and then sets aside his food for the noontime. Then he goes out to practice his meditation. He's 17 years old in this sutta. He's about 17 years old. He's going to go and teach soon. His father knows this, the Buddha. And Sariputta is coaching him on breathing meditation. Okay. That's the setup. And the Buddha goes to where he is and asks Sariputta, where is he sitting? And goes up and stops him, interrupts him, and sits down and teaches this to him. And this is the place where you find out how the Buddha was using the elements to contribute to successful meditation. And what it's talking about when it describes five of the six uh, elements that he teaches, it's talking to you about the nature of the element and how you can apply that whenever a hindrance comes up and is attacking you, what you can do that is similar to the um, element. That's, so you remember the descriptions of the element and then afterwards he talks to him about in meditation, meditate like the earth and he explains that. Then he says, when you meditate, meditate like the air, meditate like the water, meditate like the fire. And then he explains to his son what it is and you'll get it when you read it. But more important for us is what he says to his son in reference to practicing the Brahma Viharas and what happens when you practice the Brahma Viharas. It's like a secret. And when I know all the pieces in the text and I read this sutta, I really get it, you know, because it's like his father is sitting down with him. He's noticed something about the sutta. He's not teaching all the monks. He's teaching his son. And so to me, as a parent, I'm looking at it saying he's teaching his son something to give him an edge that nobody else has about the hindrances, a secret thing about the hindrances. So what can that be? So it, in me, it triggers an investigation again. So what's the investigation? Well, I'll just show you real quick. It's like when you develop meditation on loving kindness, any ill will will be abandoned. You cannot have thoughts of ill will when you are practicing loving kindness. It's impossible. So what he's saying. Develop meditation on compassion, any thoughts of cruelty will be abandoned. You see? That's the 
Compassion is going to destroy, it's going to stop cruelty from coming up in your mind. The next one is altruistic joy or appreciative joy and any discontent. When you're having joy, you cannot be discontent at the same time you're having joy. It doesn't work. You can't do it. And the last one is equanimity. And when you're having uh, your equanimity, thoughts of aversion will be abandoned. Now, why is that so important to me? Because I'm, I really study the hindrances a lot. And what we did one time when I was over in um, uh, Malaysia, I had a room of, of students, we put up a board and we went to seven different suttas that list all the different hindrances we could find. And at the top of the board, what we put were the names of the hindrances, the five, the five hindrances, okay? But then um, above that, we put these hindrances. We put ill will, cruelty, discontent, and aversion. Then we ran an experiment. We went through sutta by sutta, and we pulled out the names of each one of the hindrances in the suttas that have all the lists of hindrances. And we put them across the board like this, okay? Then we went from the bottom of the page to each one of those to see if they, the seed for, um, for those hindrances came from the five or did it come from the four above it? In other words, the five hindrances are they rooted from these four? And then you go, wow, what did the Buddha do for Rahula that day? <laughs> what did he do? He taught him, if you practice the Brahma Viharas, you'll develop a mind that the other hin all these hindrances cannot come in. Because if you have destroyed ill will, cruelty, discontent, and aversion, the others can't come up because they, that was the seed for them. You see? This is amazing. And you can say what you want about it. Of course, what I'm saying is just conjecture. It's just my opinion from what I did and how I dug it out. And we had fun doing it. The class and I had fun doing it. And at the end, we had this ridiculous whiteboard with all these lines. There was only maybe one or two that didn't go back all the way to the four. That's amazing. There's something like 40 or 50 hindrances there when we got finished. And he showed his son how he could abolish all of them from arising. If he was keeping the Brahma Viharas working in his mind, that's what he showed him. So this is what I mean when I'm saying purification. Perel, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, Sister Kima, can you mm -hmm. please explain to me how sloth and torpor uh, can be connected to these four. Hmm. Okay. Let's look. Tell me the four. <laughs> Tell me the four again. <laughs> ill will. Yeah. Cruelty. So Ill, Ill will. And then what's the next one? Cruelty. Cruelty. Discontent. Yeah. Discontent. Yeah. Aversion. And what? Aversion. 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 Yeah. Okay. Now. You have, to imagine, you have to check students when they come into class. And how do they get like this? <laughs> Mostly this is discontent. I don't want to be in this class. I want to be somewhere else. Hmm. You know? And they're discontented with having to study history. What the use is history? Goodness, what do we need history for? It doesn't have anything to do. And I'm going to go out with this boy and I don't want to talk about history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Then you've got aversion. So aversion, they have aversion to something and they're trying to do something else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So remember, always remember about sloth and torpor. Sloth and torpor is not, there's different kinds, but most of the time, if it's just coming up and you're meditating a whole lot, it can happen because, um, because you are um, actually physically tired and you're exhausted, okay? But that's not what it really is. That's not the stronger definition for it. Mm -hmm. And um, one man was writing about the uh, practice and he said, that doesn't exist. And I said, yes, sloth and torpor does exist, but sloth and torpor exists as a mental reaction to something which occurred where you have some discontent happen and it can also come, remember, these things don't happen one, one at a time. You know, if we took, if we took the five of them and we looked at um, sloth and torpor, restlessness, guilt, and remorse, and we looked at doubt, okay, and hatred and aversion. So that's four of them there, okay? And we said, you killed something. You got angry and you killed something. And then for the rest of the week, you're just, it has a lot of effect on you. The, what's going to happen to you is, first of all, you had hatred. You had hatred and an aversion to the dog that was howling. Yeah. And then you, <laughs> it's like, do, let's do a country version of it. Okay. You had hatred and aversion to this dog that was howling every night. Okay. You just hated it. Okay. That came up in the incident. And then you shot the dog. You went out and killed the dog, was dying. So you just decided to kill it. So you killed the dog. Now you're looking at the whole thing thinking, I probably shouldn't have killed the dog. And so you're feeling restlessness, guilt, and remorse. Yeah. And you can be um, restlessness. The modern one about restlessness is unfaithfulness in a relationship. Honestly, this is true. It's very funny now. You know, you can travel to different parts of the world. You go to the coffee shop and you watch the men's legs while they're sitting and having coffee in the coffee shop. Now I had a really weird experience because I was in Sri Lanka and all, a, a lot of the men were just bouncing their legs and just really, really, really restless, restless, they couldn't sit still. I went to Malaysia and I went to this big mall and not one man in the place was bouncing his leg around or restless. And I'm thinking in terms of being unfaithful, well, you better not be unfaithful in a Muslim country. That's bad news. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking, I don't know how this is working. I don't know what's happening. If you look at that or something, you know, or if you are drinking and you don't want anybody to know you're drinking alcohol and you feel really guilty about it, that's another one where the leg starts bobbing around. I had a salesman who his, his, he felt because he had a big job for $100,000 a year with a drug company selling drugs, uh, that he had to hang out with the other men who were going all over the country selling stuff for companies. And all these guys are always drinking. And he said, I never was drinking. And I said, well, why? He told us, he came, he said, I can't sit anymore. Well, why can't you sit? And he went, I don't know. And he went out. And then his father said, he'll come back tomorrow night. He came back the next night. Auntie said again, okay, what precept did you break? And he went, well, <laughs> and he told the story. He said, I cannot sit there at a, at a table with a bunch of people who are drinking and not drink. And all these people will reject me. And this is my new social group while I'm traveling. This is the people I'm hanging out with. So I looked at him and I said, number one, I can tell you the long way or the short way. The short way is to say, when this happens, all of the lemons, they all go to the cliff and they jump off and kill themselves. Are you going to go and jump off the cliff? <laughs> Short way. You don't have to go and jump off the cliff because everybody else jumped off the cliff, okay? All right. The long way is when I was a singer and I was out there singing professionally, the more involved I got into it, the more stuff was around me that I didn't want to have anything to do with. This is before I was Buddhist, okay? But my solution was different and I did fine. And he said, what did you do? 
I always went to the bartender when we were performing in an expensive supper club or dinner club or anything. I went to the bartender and told him, you the drink is always going to be in a martini glass with seven up and an olive. No alcohol whatsoever. Who knows the difference? Fine, everybody's comfortable. I'm not going to preach to somebody about not drinking, but I don't want people to be uncomfortable. But the most interesting thing about this is watching how stupid people behave when they are drinking. Okay, I didn't want anything to do with the business anymore. <laughs> it wasn't about singing that made me leave. There were some things about lyrics I didn't like at all, but, but I, that wasn't the problem. The problem was the environment of where we were performing. Even if we were doing road trips and concerts, it was a problem. And finally, I just, I didn't want anything more to do with it, you know? So, but when you look at something, you have to remember how the hindrances work. You do an act, all right, real quick karma thing here. Karma is four pieces, not three. One, two, three, four. First part is chaitana, and that is your intention of what you're gonna do. See, now this guy, I said he killed the dog. The dog was keeping him up all night and he decided just to go out and shoot the dog and go to bed. Well, that's not a very good reason. It's a very weak, very weak decision on the why he's doing this, very poor, not loving at all, not kind or anything, just really crummy and very personal, just personal and everything. It's not cool that he did that. That's his chaitana, all right. So the next one is the kama. And the kama is just action. All you have to say about kama, it's action. The action that you take can be verbal or physical action. Okay, they're the dangerous ones. You don't get in trouble for your thought unless it's preoccupying you and you just let it go and change channels. Okay, but it's, the bad danger in the comma in the, the action is your verbal action. Words can't be taken back, unfortunately. And the action is the other one, you know, um, the physical action. Now, the third one they have, they have abandoned. This is the story of a word that has been abandoned. The third word is vipaka. Vipaka today is taught as the result from karma, which it is not. Vipaka is the ripening, the ripening of the action. Now, I, people thought I was crazy because I was saying there were four pieces, but there are definitely four pieces. Plant a seed for an apple tree. The tree comes up, that's the action. The apple forms on the branch. And is that the fruit of the apple tree? No, it has to have a period of ripening. And then you have the fruit of your action. This is the fourth piece. But today they lump together Wipaka and the, uh, the uh, Fasa, or is that, no, what is it? Um, mm, oh, fruit, I can't remember fruit. They, they, write, they pull together fruit and um, ripening together, and it's not together. You can't eat green apples, you get sick, <laughs> okay? So in this case, the man kills the dog. Then he's restless and he can't sleep. He, he's, and his sloth and torpor during the daytime, he's, there's a sloth and torpor from the incident. Sloth and torpor in the daytime because he didn't sleep from the restlessness last night, see? And then he has not just restlessness, he has restlessness, guilt, and remorse. These are the three pieces of that. He has all three pieces hitting him. And he is absolutely miserable. Now the sad part about the story is he thinks he's out in the country. Let's say it was a Buddhist story. He has to find a monk before he can take the precepts again. That's really sad because the precepts belong to you. You don't need me to take your precepts. It's nice for you to be able to go to the temple and do it together as a community to take the precepts, but you don't need me. If you break a precept at work, you don't have to come to the temple to, be, to do this. You can just stop. 
I did something, I fell off the track. Okay, sister said I fell off the track. You forgive yourself, you take the precept again, you get back on the track and you keep going. And if you wanna know someone who did that all the time, it was Baba Sahib. He did that all the time. Baba Sahib did that all the time. When he's working and struggling in the development of Buddhism in India, all the things he had to go through. And he fell down, what do you think? He fell down, he went home and cried? No. He knew what it all meant. The monk had taught him what it all meant. And he went, and he, for, you forgive yourself. Somebody told me once, there's no forgiveness in Buddhism. I said, what are you saying? It's in the service, isn't it? Is it Kayana Wachitutena? Is that right? That's the point, Kayana Wachitutena, right, man? Okay. You're asking for forgiveness. How can you tell me there's no forgiveness in Buddhism? <laughs> You're doing that in front of the Buddha. So you do it to yourself. Kaya, you know what you pertain to? I forgive myself. I take the precepts. I get up and I keep going. No, I'm preparing you to change the whole world. You cannot just sit down. <laughs> There's no reason to. So you see, one thing Bhati's always pointing out about this, if you've heard him talk, these uninvited guests, which we call them the uninvited guests who stop by to pick on you, the hindrances, do not usually come alone. <laughs> they come in teams, in groups. Only one that might show up that's by herself is cousin doubt. Yeah, when doubt comes up. Now, I don't know if Dr. Kwa is here or not, but, but in Sunday school, uh, they would not remember these penances. They just wouldn't do it. They, it's like a mental block. And I said, okay, then you have, will you memorize a story for me? And they said, what story? <laughs> and I said, I'm going to tell you the story of a family reunion picnic. And they said, really? For who? And I said, the Nawarana clan. <laughs> the Nawarana clan is the family called the Nawaranas, and they live in the universe. See? And what happens is when you have a family picnic with the Noir and a clan, oh my gosh, it's a mess. <laughs> First two people that show up are Mrs. Lust and Mr. Greed. That's the first couple, Lust and Greed. They sit down at this table and they take an awful lot of the food when it's served. <laughs> the second couple that shows up is Hatred and Aversion. Mr. Hatred and Mrs. Aversion. Hatred and Aversion. They sit down at a different table. They don't want to sit at the same table. And they're full of jealousy and they tell stories about jealousy and just hatred about this and disagreement with that, all this stuff. And they just are down on everything. And then the, the triplets show up. They live very far away. They always come late. And their names are restlessness, guilt, and remorse. They sit at a table together and hang out. People stop by and they visit them and they talk to them some, but they don't stick around a lot because nobody likes this stuff, but they are there and they attend. And then the twins come. The twins actually came for, before them, sloth and torpor. And sloth and torpor, they, they just find a place to sit. And the tables are close together and they can kind of criticize each other from wherever they are. It's amazing. And the last one that shows up at the picnic is a cousin, a distant cousin. And this is a woman who never got married, couldn't get along with anybody and agree to anything. And she comes and she's the one that starts the problems in the group. And her name is Cousin Doubt. I doubt this picnic is going to be succeed. I doubt you're not going to get sick from the food. I doubt it isn't going to rain. I doubt someone won't drown in the river. It's on and on and on. She just pick, pick, pick. And why do we have these tables? It should have been that one. This is cousin doubt. You can see that everybody is very eager for one thing in this picnic when they come together. And that is and Nietzsche applies. <laughs> it's going to be over soon and they can all go home. 
Yeah, so they memorized it and they passed the test. <laughs> That's how they memorized it. You make up some way of remembering this all the time. That's what you have to do, okay? Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Does that answer your question though? Answers your question, okay? Mm -hmm. Anybody else have a question? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody? Yeah? Hello, hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> so you're all doing, hi. Look at this little one. Oh, look at this. Oh, do you want to see something special? Here we go. This is, let's see. We go like this with your fingers. Daddy can do this. You can go like this with your fingers. This is, this, this is the uh, temple. And this is the steeple. Okay, the steeple. And you open up, I can't show you this. Let's see, can you see, the, see my fingers? Open up the doors and there are all the people. <laughs> you see? So you go like this again, this way. This is the temple, like this, like that, with your fist closed. And then you're going to make the steeple, right? The steeple. And that's where the bell is, in this bell, right? And then you open up the doors and here are all the people. <laughs> the people are inside. That's the way we do that. Oh, that's good. <laughs> sadu, sadu, sadu. Anybody else? <laughs> okay. Yep. Okay. F Fendi. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, sister. Uh, mm -hmm. How do uh, people develop the investigation? I think uh, uh, like like Bante and you are very, very uh, curious about things. So uh, mm -hmm. you two are, are very much investigative. Uh, <laughs> so how do we, how do we develop? How what? How do we develop investigation? How what? How do we develop investigation? How do, how we, do we develop investigation? Oh, you get curious, okay? The mo See, the thing is, you have to, first of all, in Buddhism, you have to want to change. You have to want to change. The whole teaching is about changing. But in order to succeed at it, first thing is you have to want the change to happen. So that's a very healthy thing to want to change and get rid of bad habits and set up healthy new habits that help you to do everything. And then, then curiosity, remember where I showed you in the document, you had the seven factors of enlightenment, but you also had curiosity, uh, persistence, and there was one other one. Other one. This is all the power of the individual person. The, the, the sad part about Buddhism is when someone comes to Buddhism and they think there is going to be immediate gratification with an answer. And there isn't. Okay. <laughs> there are simple basic things we can show you that you can see that they are true but there isn't immediate gratification and you just start changing unless you apply yourself. Nobody can perform Buddhism on you. You are in control of your, you're of actually creating your life experience. And he's showing you how you can personally take control of this experience and steer the boat in the right direction. It's like a boat. Yeah? Okay. This is for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. When you ask the question, how, ask the question again. Ask your question again. Effendi? Uh, yes. Yeah. So how, how do we develop uh, investigation? 
You just listened to one hour of it. How do you do it? How do you do it? How do you investigate? Okay. I'll show you some next week when this other, I already did this other half of this thing. Next week when we do another one of these, I'm going to show you how uh, the, the twin practice fulfills all the requirements for investigation. See, the bhavana is the actual invest, investigation, learning what mindfulness is your observation. It's your observation skill. And it has a special talent. This mindfulness that develops has a talent for remembering and reminding you to keep doing the steps properly in right effort. You see? And that is your investigation as you're practicing and something, something, um, something, mm. As you're practicing and you're investigating, you start to investigate. Oh boy, I'm Brussels. I just went blank. Oh boy, senior moment. <laughs> senior moment, right? We call it a senior moment. Um, how do you investigate is what we're just explaining all the different ways that you're investigating. And if you have been given the instructions for TWIM, that's the the path for the investigation. You sit and you use the meditation is to be able to see it's your instrument. Like if I give you a microscope, what the Buddha is giving you a microscope, he's showing you a special kind of, of meditation where you can stay alert and aware of everything inside that's happening. Next week, I'll explain to you, this is not like you close your eyes and go to sleep. Not like that. When you close your, when you look with your eyes in front of you, you don't just see here in between your hands like a horse sees this way. Straight, that's all a horse sees. But in the human eye, we have peripheral vision, what we see on either side. So when something comes up, it doesn't always come up here or come this way. What arises comes from the sides or it comes up from in front of us. You, you understand? People think when you close your eyes, there's no peripheral vision. But when you start practicing this way, there is peripheral vision. And when you watch inside, close your eyes, and watch inside, there also is things that can happen from the side, especially when we're in uh, the base of infinite consciousness. You don't always see, if any of you have been practicing and you've been in infinite consciousness, you know that you don't always see the little lights when those little tiny pieces start happening. You don't just see them happen here. They go click, 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 like this. And then they start to go slower and they start to go slower as you bring your attention and you sharpen your observation, you begin to see them and they look like they're going in slow motion. These are consciousnesses arising, existing, passing away, arising, existing, passing away. But the first time you see them, they're going and you don't, you can't watch them. See? So you, all the pieces of the training, all the pieces of your practice are happening in Side the tranquil wisdom insight meditation. The practice, the right effort itself, those four steps in right effort encompass everything you need to take you all the way through to cessation and experience the different mundane nibbanas until you get to the super mundane nibbana. You see? So you, if you're practicing twim now, if you're practicing it, um, you begin to understand you already have the map. The place you need help with usually is what do I do when something comes up? How do I treat these hindrances? And what we've said to you in the past many times is the secret to this interruption is not what it is. 
It's about how it happened and how does the hindrance exist and what makes it operate and how do I solve it? Yeah? It was never an enemy, but somewhere, whether it's the Vasudhi Maga, it sort of is the Vasudhi Maga, but I think it's other places too, they've decided it's an enemy that should be defeated and it needs to be destroyed, annihilated, eradicated, suffocated, suppressed, and subdued. But it doesn't need that. It only needs to be released and allowed and relinquished and abandoned and let it go and leave it alone. And then it'll stop. That tells you a secret, doesn't it? Tells you something about if I pay attention to it, maybe I'm feeding it. Aha, and if you're feeding it, it's going to stay longer and get stronger and come back for more food. This is the way the Buddha describes it and explains it, but we're ignoring those suttas. We're not teaching them usually, but these are not secrets that we're keeping from you. Like I told you, if the monks went to the university, they were not exposed to these and their teachers were not exposed and we don't know how far back this goes, but they're not exposed anymore to these suttas. Therefore, it's easy for them to just accept for heaven's sakes, do you know the name Buddha Gosa, what it means? Does anybody tell me what it means? One person can tell us. Huh? It means voice of the Buddha. Voice of the Buddha. Oh my gosh, how can you disagree with the voice of the Buddha? Oh my goodness, how can we argue with the voice of the Buddha? This was so precipitous that his name is Buddha Gosa, you know? I, can't. I was just, for five years, this is true. I've been doing this 20 years. For five years, I did not know that name meant. I never knew. And when someone told me, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry, but I was just weeping. I couldn't believe, well, that's what happened. This just explains everything. Nobody is going to argue with the voice of the Buddha. But it takes some work to find out that this voice of the Buddha is disagreeing with the vo voice of the Buddha. And you have to take the time to take this book and go do what the Buddha told you to do in the Parinibbana Sutta. What did he tell Ananda? Any teacher who comes here in the future want to know if that person is teaching what I taught, you have to take it and compare it to the teaching in the video. You have to, you have to. Are they doing it? Mm -mm. That's the problem, okay? Now, is this unconquerable? No, it's not unconquerable. <laughs> you make a personal choice. Do you really want to know what the man said and what happened to him? And I come very precociously show up and I said to Bonte, I don't know if we're going to get along. And he said, why? And I said, because I have these questions and I don't know if you're going to answer them. And as we were traveling together, we would, he, we would have nothing talk about anything except when we're driving. And we're always talking about Dhamma, nothing else. And I discovered his questions were the same questions I had. That's why we get along. What did this man do, Siddhartha? Did he find anything? Did he find an answer to suffering? Did he find an antidote and an escape? If he did find one, did he leave the instructions someplace? And if we take those instructions, will they work today? Don't you want to know that? That's what I want to know. And he said, that's what I'm still here. That's what I've been doing all these years. That's why we get along, because that's our whole thing. And I get... Um, I see how easy this is 
once somebody said to me once, how can I share Buddhism? All my friends are not Buddhist. What do I do? And I started laughing. <laughs> first of all, go to Malaysia and get in a taxi. <laughs> That's the first thing to do. You know, uh, I have a package deal. I can sell it to you for 1995. It's called Taxi Dama. <laughs> This is where you teach a person who is not Buddhist about basic things that are just human, okay? You use Anicca Dukkha Anatta as a system to explain that everybody knows what Anicca is basically by definition, but they forget. They forget what it really means. They never maybe ever got it, internally got it. And once you internally get it, you start applying it to everything. You see? Why should you get upset that the dog peed by the front door? <laughs> Why? Because if you clean it up, it's gone. It's over. <laughs> Why should you get upset if somebody took your seat on the bus or, or somebody took your seat at uh, some meeting or something? Just, it doesn't have to happen again. Just sit somewhere else. Why is it when, you know, you're doing something at the office and all of a sudden they give your basket of work for the day, this is it. Your basket of work for the day is empty and you're done. But then the guy comes through and he puts more in the basket. Oh my gosh. You know, and if they say that you have to do it, you can laugh your way through because you know something they forgot. And that is a Nietzsche. Whatever arises, passes away. Whatever you're doing has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And then things move in the past. And then there's the future that you worry about. You know, and the story, the taxi driver, it's, the taxi driver was just fantastic. I mean, the, the guy, I get in the taxi, I have an hour's ride to get from Colombo over to Panadora. And I usually get in the back seat and check my email in the city limits until we get out and just stay quiet. But I get in the taxi and the man was really upset and I could sense the anger in the car, the, the, the energy was wrong. And he's just, and he's on the phone. The minute we start driving, he's on the phone <laughs> babbling. And, and then when he gets off, I said, so uh, you're not having a good day. Oh, I'm not having a good day, he says. Oh, let me tell you what happened. I, I said, well, what's wrong? Oh, this, this man, he got in my taxi and, and he told me where to turn and he told me how fast to go and when to stop and when to do this and when to do that. And nobody can do that because this taxi is my taxi and it's my world and nobody can do that. This is my world. And he had no right to do that. And this man was really upset. And I said to him, I said, are you Buddhist? Do you have a Buddha up there? And he said, yes, 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 I am Buddhist. He has a little Buddha on the front of his dashboard. And I said, you were just talking to your wife, weren't you? He said, how did you know? I said, well, you just had to tell her what happened to the man. Oh, I certainly did because that man, he, and he told me the whole story again. <laughs> it's like this, you did, well, you know, um, do you remember, do you, you're Buddhist. Why are you upset? He said, why can't I be upset? He said, that's a terrible thing what he did. Why he did this? And I, shh, 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 I said, do you remember Sunday school? And he said, yes. Well, in Sunday school, do you remember hearing a word called Anicca? He said, no. Yeah, I said, what does it mean? No, 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 no. Th things change. I said, well, the man isn't in the car anymore. Yes, but that man, I don't want to hear the story anymore, but let's look at the reality of this. I'm in the car now and you're driving and there's no reason to be upset because the man is gone. He said, but he shouldn't have done that. He shouldn't have done that. I said, okay. <laughs> he's just harping on this thing. And finally, I got this man to realize that whatever happens to you, there's no reason for you to ever be upset. Because after all, the man did get in the car. I said, look at it this way. Did the man get out of the car? He said, well, yes. <laughs> it's a taxi. And I said, well, then why is he still in the car? <laughs> Why is he still in the car? And then he sort of began to get the idea. And, and he said, he said, well, what should I do? What should I do? I said, just let it go. Because in the future, right now we're in the present. I'm in the car. 
And you know, in, in the future, it isn't here yet. So you can determine, anyway, I said, did you look at these buildings going by? Some of them don't even have air conditioning in them. I said, what's that, what's, what's about that? You are so lucky. You are not considering how lucky you are. You're in this cab. What do you mean? I'm a taxi driver. And I said, you're a taxi driver, but this is a brand new car. It's a kangaroo cab. And, and it's a brand new car. It has adjustable seats and air conditioning and buttons on everywhere on the doors. And it's a beautiful car. It's like your own bubble, your own world. And, and if somebody upsets you like that, man, when it gets out, you don't have to worry anymore because you know something. Everybody's going to get out because that's a Nietzsche. And he said, well, yeah. Anyway, we went through this whole thing. I said, did you think about those people in the buildings? If somebody doesn't like somebody up there or makes them angry, they're stuck in that hot office for eight hours and they can't go home and there's no AC. But you, you're a taxi driver. You're in an incredibly rich, comfortable environment that you can control entirely. And he said, yeah, I'm a taxi driver. So we got to the end of the trip and he didn't charge me anything. <laughs> and then I think, I'm never gonna see this taxi driver again. But six months later, something happened. I went to a bookstore in downtown Colombo. And when I went to pick the books, go down the steps to get my taxi, a man jumped out of the taxi and he opened the door for me and he helped me get in the cab. When I got in the cab, he said, um, do you remember me? And I said, remember you? And he said, look at the Buddha. And I looked at the Buddha and I knew right away who it was because at the bottom of the Buddha was a little sign, Anicca. <laughs> Whatever arises passes away. And he said, I want you to know that you changed my life. I said, really? <laughs> it was just a taxi ride after all. And he said, no, you changed my life. But more than that, my wife loves you. And I said, what does your wife have to do with this? And he said, well, when I married my wife, <clears throat> her mother did not want us to get married. And through my whole marriage, I've had a terrible problem ever visiting her mother because she won't leave me alone and she's mean and she picks on me and I get upset with her and I always want to go right home. But now everything has changed. I said, why? And he said, because now when I go to see her mother, I get my tea, I go out on the porch and I remember one thing. Anicca. <laughs> I said, it changes everything because I know when I go there, no matter what happens with her mother, it's going to change. It's going to be over and it's going to change. But that's wonderful. To me, it was a special story. You see? Because this is how Buddhism spreads. Little tiny droplets and incidences. This is how you can drop a pebble in the water and it's still and you drop the pebble to the taxi driver but the ripples go out and then after a while all the taxi drivers know about sister Kama. <laughs> you'll run into a taxi driver oh your sister Kama. we know about you <laughs> and they don't they might be muslim they might be a jew they might be a christian they might be and i didn't tell them it was anything really about the buddha I've done the same story with a Muslim or a Jew or anything. It doesn't matter. The Buddha teach Buddhists. Think about it for a minute. He didn't do it for Buddhists. They didn't happen till after he was gone. When he did a search, he did it for human beings. That's what he did. So this this very simple explanation of where this 50-year Christian ends up in robes for 20 years as a Buddhist nun. <laughs> How did that happen? God put me here. You can say what you want, but this works because it's an answer. He gives you the answer to all the things that are wrong with you in life. That's why 
I keep doing it because yeah, you guys sure. are telling me how things get different. So it is nine already. Do you want to end now? <laughs> okay, we had fun tonight. So on Saturday, um, we're going to uh, have a, a sutra, and I'll tell you which one. I have to figure it out tomorrow. It's sort of a toss up between two or three of them. We'll do a sutta on Saturday, and then Effendi, we will go into more of what you're talking about when we're talking about the practice next Wednesday. Okay, we'll do it then, because that one is really going to get into the heart of this thing, the map, the map of how we get there. Okay, All right. So let's say our prayer. Okay. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that you have thus acquired for the impermanence of all kinds of happiness. Beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of our Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.